Oh, good morning, dear students. Uh, my name is Farhan Mazar, and today is uh, 23rd of March 2021. And today, the subject we are studying is Physics 5054. It's O levels physics. And uh, today, we have set our hearts to solve May, June 2020, 1 1 paper. It's a uh, MCQ paper. We call it paper one. So let's start and the first question on your screen, the diagram shows the resultant R of a three Newton force and a four Newton force that act at a point P. The angle between the three Newton force and a four Newton force can uh, be any value from zero degree to 90 degree which value of the r is not possible so you can see that there here we have they have shown uh, two uh, two uh, forces three newton and four newton and he says uh, the, the he's telling you the two extreme angles if the angle between the two forces is zero degree and if the angle between them is 90 degree so we will consider both the cases if the angle between them is zero degree. So we will calculate how much will be their resultant. And when the angle between them is 90 Newton, uh, sorry, 90 degree, what will be the, what will, will be their resultant? I've done this on a paper. Let me show you. So uh, let me increase the size. Okay, so here we come. So if that theta is zero, and then I, I, on your screen you can see that the that the vectors will be like this: three newton force and the four newton force. Their resultant will be simply their arithmetic sum: three plus four, seven newton. If the angle between the two forces is ninety newton, uh, ninety degrees, sorry. And uh, you can see here I have shown three Newton and uh, on the head of the three Newton, I have shown the four Newton force and the angle between them is 90. So if the triangular law, according to the triangular law or according to the head to tail rule, the resultant will be I will join the tail of the first vector with the head of the last vector. <laughs> Because this is a right angle triangle, so I can find the magnitude of the resultant or magnitude of this hypotenuse with applying by applying the Pythagoras theorem. Hypotenuse square is equal to perpendicular square plus base square. R square will be equal to 3 square plus 4 square. R square will be equal to 9 plus 16. R square will be equal to 25. I will take square root on both the sides. So R will be 5. So when the angle varies from 0 degree to 90 degree, the, the, the resultant will vary from 7 Newton to 5 Newton. So the range of the answer is from 7 Newton to 5 Newton only. So uh, let me uh, go back. Let me go back and check what happens. So his question is, the angle between the 3 Newton force and the 4 Newton force can be any value from 0 to 90 degree, which value of the R is not possible. He says, which value is not possible? Our range is from 7 to 5. So which value is out of that range? The 4 Newton. So A is the right option. A cannot be the answer. I hope that this question is clear to you. The next question on your screen, what is measured using a micrometer? Micrometer basically measures the length. It measures the diameter, which is the length actually. So very simple question. So question number two, C is the choice.
the graph shows a short journey it is a speed time graph so the graph which is shown on your screen on the y axis the speed is represented on the x axis the time is represented the speed is in meter per second and the time is in seconds what is the greatest speed reached the greatest speed reached is this one which is approximately 3 meter per second so c is the choice c is the correct choice for question number 3 the car sorry a car of weight 11000 newton moves with constant velocity along a horizontal road a driving force of 5000 newton acts on the car what is the force opposing the motion of the car the very important wording is here a car of weight 11000 newton moves with constant velocity along a horizontal road so it's not moving up it's not moving downward the car moves with a constant velocity on a horizontal when the car is moving with the constant velocity it means that the resultant force is zero when the resultant force is zero it means that the driving force and the opposing force or the resistive force they both are equal to each other because the car is moving at the constant velocity it means that the resultant force is zero it means that the driving force and the opposing force they are opposite to each other they are equal in magnitude so if the driving force is 5000 newton the opposing force should also be 5000 newton so a is the right answer 5000 newton question number 4 a is the right answer a man with an open parachute falls to earth at constant speed the following forces act p the upward force of the parachute on the man q the upward force of the pan on the earth r the downward force of the earth on the parachute s the downward force of the man on the parachute which two forces are a newton's third law pair in the newton's third law pair you see if the body a will apply force on the body b the body b will apply force on the body a both the action and the reaction they will be equal in magnitude but opposite in direction so the a will apply force on b and the b will apply force on a the p says the upward force of the parachute on the man the parachute applied force on the man and the man will apply force on the parachute the upward force of the parachute on the man the downward force of the man on the parachute you see body a applied force on the body b the body b applied force on the body a the direction of the force is opposite to each other the parachute applies force in upward direction on the man and the man applies force on the parachute in the downward direction so p and s is newton's third law pair p and s so c is the right option question number 5 c is the right option a box is pulled up a rough slope as shown so the direction of the motion is along that slope a box is pulled up a rough slope as shown in which direction does friction act on the box the friction is always 
opposite to the direction of the motion. The friction is always opposite to the direction of the motion. So the direction of the friction should be D. The direction of the friction should be D for question number six. D is the right option. The diagram shows a motorcyclist leaning over in order to turn the corner to the left. Which force causes him to turn? Whenever you take a turn, whenever you may move in a circle, whenever you are rotating in a circular path, you see the centripetal force acts on you. There is a resultant force which is always directed towards the center of that circle. So because the man is leaning in this way, so he's moving in this circular path, so the direction of the resultant force, which is uh, moving him in a circle, that should be directed towards the center of that circle in which he is turning. So I think that A is the right answer. Question number seven, A is the right answer, sir. Which type of force causes the earth to orbit the sun? So you see the earth and the sun, they both have mass according to the Newton's law of gravitation. They both uh, attract each other. So the sun, the earth is orbiting the sun because the sun has gravity. So due to the gravitational attraction, the earth is orbiting the sun. So question number eight, which type of force causes the earth to orbit the sun? C is the right option, gravitational. Question number eight, C is the right option. Four objects of different masses are on different planets. The weight of each object on its planet is determined. Which object is on the planet with the smallest gravitational field strength? You see... In the four options A, B, C, D, the weight is given, the mass is given. And we know that W equals to mg. W is weight, M is mass, and G is the gravitational field strength. G is equals to W divided by M. I've done this on a paper. Let me show you my work. So let me increase the size. Okay. So W is equals to MG. G is equals to W divided by M for the first option. G will be equals to weight divided by mass. 125 divided by 5, 25 Newton per kg. The G value on the A. On the B, 150 is the, uh, is the weight, 115 is the mass. So 10 Newton per kg. And G for the C is 220 divided by 20. And 11 Newton per uh, kg. And G for the D option will be 225 divided by 25 equals to 9 Newton per kg. Their question is where on which planet we have the least gravitational field strength, where we have the least value of the G. So clearly it's D option, planet D. Let's go back, check, take the option. So D, D is the right answer. Question number nine, D will have the smallest gravitational field strength. You see the same data, same story, but they can ask you the quest same question in another way. They might ask you, in some other paper, they might ask you the greatest gravitational field strength. But here particularly, 
they have asked smallest gravitational field strength. So D is the right option, sir. Which physical quantity does not change when a piece of copper is heated? Whenever you heat some object, one thing which cannot change is the mass of the body. By raising the temperature, by lowering the temperature, by compressing, by applying force, one thing which you cannot change of an object is its mass. Density can be changed. Temperature can be changed. Volume can be changed. But by heating, you cannot change the mass. His question is, which physical quantity does not change? Mass. B is the option. Question number 10. B is the right option. A single metal bolt has a mass 34 grams. So one bolt, its mass is 34 grams. Three of the bolts, it's very important. How many bolts? Three bolts. One bolt is 34 gram. But now he's using three bolts. So the total mass will be 34 multiplied three. Three of the bolts are immersed in a wiring cylinder with, that contains 30 cubic centimeter of water. Of water, yeah. Let me reduce the size so you can see the whole question. Okay. A single metal bolt has a mass of 34 grams. Three of the bolts are immersed in a wiring cylinder that contains 30 cubic centimeter of water. The reading on the mining cylinder rises to 42 centimeter cube. What is the density of the metal? Very simple. I have done this on a paper. Let me show you my work. So, volume one, when there was just water, that was 30 centimeter cube. V2, when you immerse three bolts, the the volume was 42 centimeter cube. So the volume of those bolts will be V2 minus V1, 42 minus 30, 12 centimeter cube. The mass of those bolts will be 34 multiplied 3, 102 gram. So density, we can calculate the formula for the density is mass divided by volume. Mass is 102 divided by 12. So 102 divided by 12, 8.5 grams per centimeter cube. 8.5 grams per centimeter cube. So let me, 8.5 cent, grams centimeter cube. So D is the right option, sir. For question number 11, D is the right option. A rocket of mass M, when empty, carries a mass M of fuel. The rocket and fuel travel at speed V. The engine of the rocket is fired and all of the fuel is expelled. The speed of the rocket increases to 2V. What happens to the kinetic energy of the rocket? It's a very, very tricky question. You see, he's only talking about the rocket is not asking you that the kinetic energy of the fuel so in the first situation the rocket its mass is m and its speed is v so its kinetic energy will be 1 by 2 mv square in the second situation the mass of the rocket is still m but its speed is now 2v so it will be like 1 by 2 into m into bracket star 2v bracket close square. I've done this on a paper. Let me show you the working. So it will become easier for you to understand. You see question number 12. Kinetic energy in the first situation is 1 by 2 into mass into velocity square. 
1 by 2 mv square. So that's the kinetic energy in the first situation for the rocket, not the fuel. Now in the second situation, let me call the kinetic energy in the second situation as kinetic energy prime, Ke prime. 1 by 2 into mass into velocity square. The mass is m. But this time the velocity is 2v. So when I will take the square of the 2v, it will become 4v square. Take this 4 to a side and 1 by 2 mv square is the previous kinetic energy. So it means that the new kinetic energy will be 4 times the previous kinetic energy. It's a very tricky question. Very, very tricky question, students. But I hope that you have understood this. So it will become four times the original kinetic energy. So I think C is the right answer. Question number 12, C is the right answer, sir. A car of mass 1000 kg is driven 200 meter up an incline so that it rises 50 meter vertically. So the, this ramp is 200 meter, but the vertical height which it gains in 200 meters is 50 meter. The acceleration of the free fall g is 10 meter per second square. What is the gain in the gravitational potential energy? The gain in the potential energy is very simple. Mgh. The formula for the gain in the gravitational potential energy is Mgh. I have done this on a paper. Let me show you my calculation. So, uh, potential energy is equal to Mgh. M is 1000. G value is 10. And the vertical height which is gained is 50. So it will be like 500,000 joules, 500,000 joules. So it looks C is the right answer. Question number 13, C is the right answer, sir. Uh, a fish is swimming 15 meter below the surface of a lake as shown. The density of the water is 1000 kg per meter cube. The atmospheric pressure is 100,000 pascal. The acceleration of the free fall G is 10 meter per second square. What is the total pressure on the fish? You see, when the fish is 15 uh, meter below the surface of the water, the fish is experiencing experiences two pressures. One, the pressure due to the water plus the pressure due to the atmosphere. So the total pressure on the fish will be the pressure due to the atmosphere plus the pressure due to the water. The pressure due to the water, the pressure due to the atmosphere is given 100,000 Pascal. The pressure due to the water can be calculated. The formula is rho g h. Rho g h, where rho is the density, g is the gravitational field strength, and h means the depth of the water above the fish. I've done this working on my, let me show you. So, so the pressure of the water is rho gh, 1000 multiply 10 multiply 15. So it will be 150,000 Pascal. The pressure of the atmosphere is 100,000 Pascal. The total pressure on the fish will be the pressure due to the water plus the pressure due to the atmosphere. So 150,000 plus 100,000. So it will be 250,000 Pascal. 
250,000 Pascal. I hope that you have understood this calculation. 250,000 Pascal. So I think D is the right option. For question number 14, D is the right option, sir. Let me reduce the size because this the whole question is not showing. The diagram shows a mercury manometer. The tube is open to the atmosphere on the right hand side. The left hand side is connected to a container containing a gas at pressure P. The atmospheric pressure on its own support a column of mercury of height. 756 millimeter which height of the column does pressure p on its own support try to understand this story so here you have a manometer this is a manometer and this limb is open to the atmosphere and this limb is connected with the with the cylinder the pressure of this gas is p and this is uh, subject to the atmosphere pressure. The difference of the level of the mercury in both the limbs, the vertical difference, is 60 millimeter. The mercury on the gas side is at higher level and the mercury on the atmosphere side is at lower level. What does this mean? It means the atmospheric pressure is more than the pressure of this gas. The atmospheric pressure is more than the pressure of this gas. That is the reason the level of the mercury in the limb, which is directly connected with the gas, the level of the mercury is higher as compared to the level of the mercury in the other limb. And the vertical difference between them is 60 mm. So it means that the pressure of this gas, the pressure P, is less than the atmospheric pressure. The atmospheric pressure is 756 mm. The pressure of this gas is 60 mm less. So it will be 756 minus 60 mm. Let me show you my work. I, I did this calculation plus minus thing on the calculator. So I hope that this is showing on your screen. The pressure of the gas will be 756, which is atmospheric pressure, minus 60. It will be 696 mm of Hg. 696. 696. I think B is the right option, sir. So question number 15, B is the right option. I hope that you have understood this question. In a weightlifting contest, an athlete lifts a metal bar of mass 20 kg fitted with the mass of 80 kg on each side. The lift from the ground to a height of 2.5 meter takes 0 0.50 seconds. The gravitational field strength G is 10 Newton per kg. What average power does the weightlifter exert in providing the gravitational potential energy during this lift? You see how much mass this man is lifting. 20 kg is this metal bar and 80 kg on this side and 80 kg on this side. So the total mass he's lifting is 180 kg. And he lifted this weight and this mass up, up to a height of 2.5 meter. So I can very easily calculate how much is the work done. The work done in this case will be equals to the gain in the potential energy. And the gain in the potential energy can be calculated by mgh. 
So M will be 180, G will be 10, and the H will be 2.5. So this is how you will calculate the work done. But this work was done in 0 0.50 second, and he want us to calculate the power. And you know the power is equal to work divided by time. So very easily I can calculate the, the, the power. I've done this on the paper. Let me show you my work. So work is power is equal to work divided by time. The work in this case is gain in the potential energy. That is MGH divided by time. M value is 180 multiply G value is 10 and the H value is 2.5 and divided by time that's 0 0.50 and you will get the answer 9000 watt. 9000 watt if you divide it with 1000 it will become 9 kilowatt. 9 kilowatt. I hope that you have understood this question, how we calculated the work done, and then dividing it with the time, we are able to find out the power. Nine kilowatt is the answer. Nine kilowatt. So I think D is the option, question number 16. D is the right option. I hope that you have understood this numerical. A boy is standing by the side of a lake. The boy drops a heavy stone from a height two meter above the water surface. The acceleration due to the gravity is 10 meter per second square. What is the speed of the stone when it hits the surface of the water? Mark this question. It's a A star question. This question is an A star question. Let me show you how I solved it. So, so first of all, I have drawn a speed time graph because when the the boy dropped the 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 the, the stone, uh, it's at the time zero. The velocity was zero. Let's suppose after the t. He will touch the water surface and at the time t, he will touch the water surface. At that moment, suppose the velocity will be v. And ignore the air resistance, so it's a straight line graph. So area under the graph will be equal to the distance traveled. And we know that the distance traveled from the hand of the boy to the surface of the water, that is 2 meter. And we know that the area under the speed time graph is equal to the distance traveled. You know, this shape, this, this shape is a right angle triangle. And the area of this will be the base, 1 by 2 into base into height. 1 by 2, the base is T and the, and the height is V. This is V and this is T. So 2 equals to 1 by 2 T into V. So T into V, this 2 go to the other side. So 4 equals to Vt. So I want to find out the value of the V basically. So T equals to 4 divided by V. T equals to 4 divided by V. Another thing which you can do is that the because the, the acceleration of this stone will be 10 meter per second square. We have ignored air resistance. So I can find out the slope of this velocity time graph. The velocity time graph, this velocity time graph, its slope will be equal to the acceleration. So take these two points and apply the formula of the slope or gradient. Y2 minus Y1 divided by X2 minus X1. You must have done in your mathematics. Slope of this velocity time graph is equal to the acceleration, whose value I already know. That's 10. So it will be V minus 0 divided by T minus 0 equals to 10. So it means V divided by T equals to 10. So V equals to 10 T. So in this T value, I will substitute 4 by V. 
So this V will go on the other side. It will become V square equals to 40. And I will take square root on both the sides. So the V will be 6.32 meter per second. 6.32 meter per second. You see, it's a very, very tricky question. 100% A star question. Hope you have understood. So V, the final velocity with which the stone will touch the water surface, that will be 6.32 meter per second. Six point three meter per second. So B looks the right option, sir. It's a tricky question. In which situation is energy being released by the fusion of hydrogen nuclei to form helium? You see what happens? The smaller hydrogen nuclei, they come close to each other and they fuse into each other and they make a large nucleus of helium. We call this process fusion. In the process of fusion, smaller nuclei fuse into each other and may make a larger nuclei, nucleus, sorry. And this is happening in the, in the center of the sun. This is happening on other stars. So in which situation is the energy being released by the fusion of hydrogen nuclei to form helium? In the decay of the carbon-14 used to date an object? No. In a radioactive isotope emitting alpha particles? No. In the center of the earth? No, no, no. In the center of the sun? Yes. Yes. For 18, D is the right option. The fusion is taking place on the sun and the other stars. Question number 19, the diagram shows a block being pulled up a slope by a force F. So the distance of this incline, inclined slope is uh, this ramp is R and the force is along this ramp and the force is F. The block reaches the new position at the top of the slope. What is the work done by the force F in moving the block to its new position? The work done when you move on a ramp, the work done can be calculated by many ways. One method is work done will be equal to the gain in the potential energy. The other method is the work done is equals to the force multiplied by the distance moved in the direction of the force. If I know the force and I know the distance covered in the direction of the force, then if you multiply force with that distance, it will give you the work done. So here I know the F and I also know the distance traveled in the direction of the F. That's R. So the work done can be calculated by multiplying F and R. So A is the right option. Question number 19, A is the right option, sir. Question number 19, A is the right option. Which statement about a mercury in glass clinical thermometer is correct? It covers a much larger range than an ordinary report laboratory thermometer. It is more sensitive than an ordinary laboratory thermometer. Its scale is not linear. Its sensitivity is affected by, a cons by the constriction in the capillary tube. The, it covers a much larger range than an ordinary laboratory thermometer. We are not sure. It is more sensitive than an ordinary laboratory thermometer. That can be that is possible. You know, and uh, the clinical thermometer it has only ten, I think, from 30, 30 to forty maximum reading. Only ten. The range is just ten. So in that length, if there is range, is just ten. 
the distance between between each degree is quite large on the clinical thermometer that's why definitely it is more sensitive than an ordinary laboratory thermometer because the distance between each degree in the clinical thermometer is quite large as compared to the uh, laboratory thermometer so b is the right choice which description of a dull black surface is correct you see the dull black surface if it is hot will be a very good emitter of the infrared radiation if the dull black surface is cold then it will be a very good absorber of the infrared radiation it will be a good absorber or it will be a good emitter it depends upon the temperature of the body if the dull black surface the body the body on which you have the dull black surface if it's hot then that dull black surface will make it a very good emitter if that body on whose surface the color is dull black if that body is cold then that dull black color will make it a very good absorber of the heat or of the infrared so a option is a good emitter good absorber and good reflector of the radiation that is not a reflector of the radiation good emitter poor absorber and poor reflector of the radiation that is wrong good emitter good absorber and poor reflector of the radiation that can be true poor emitter poor absorber and poor reflector of the radiation that's right that's not right so c looks the best option good emitter good absorber and poor reflector of the radiation i think question number 21 c is the right option the best option available question number 22 the temperature of a body increases by 1 degree centigrade which other quantity also increases when the temperature of the body increases by 1 degree centigrade the internal energy i think should increase heat capacity no internal energy no uh, internal energy yes specific heat capacity no specific latent heat no they don't increase when you raise the temperature the internal energy will also increase i think question number 22 b is the right option sir question number 23 a thermal the thermal energy produced by an electric heater in 3 minutes in 3 minutes is used to melt wax the solid wax is initially at its melting point of 60 degree centigrade the specific latent heat of the wax is 220 joules per gram the heater supplies 7700 joules of thermal energy to the wax some of the wax melts how much wax melts so is uh, is talking about the state change how much wax melts is talking about the state change and whenever the state changes we use the formula heat is equals to m multiply l heat is equals to m multiply l let me show you my work i've done this on a paper so hopefully this is showing on your screen and it says heat is equals to m multiply l heat is 7700 and m is question and the specific latent heat is 220 220 will go on the other side it will divide 7700 divided by 220 equals to 35 gram so 35 gram because the unit which we use for the latent heat it has it was in grams so 23 question b is the option sir i hope that you have understood this numerical which row explains why a liquid has a fixed volume but does not have a fixed shape the reason is 
the intramolecular force, forces are quite strong, but the molecules are free to move within the liquid. Question number 24, I think A is the best option. A is the best option, sir. That is why the liquid has fixed volume, but it does not have a fixed shape. A fixed mass of gas is enclosed in a cylinder by a piston, which is free to move. Which combination of changes to the pressure and to the temperature must increase the density of the gas? If you want to increase the density, the pressure should increase. And if you want to increase the density, the temperature should decrease. When the pressure will increase, the volume will reduce, the mass will still be the same, and the density will increase. If you will raise that, if you will decrease the temperature, the mass will decrease. If you decrease the temperature, the mass will decrease. Mass obviously is constant. So mass divided by volume is density. If you decrease the temperature, the volume will decrease. So the density will increase. So the pressure should increase and the temperature should decrease. Question number 25, I think pressure should increase and the temperature should decrease. So C is the best option. It's a little tricky question. It's a repeat question. Light enters a glass block at an angle of incidence I and it produces an angle of refraction R in the glass. Several different values of I and R are measured and a graph is drawn of sine I against sine R. Which graph is correct? So you see the glass, the light is entering into the glass block and we have drawn here a graph of on the y-axis we have represented the sine i and on the x-axis we have represented the sine r. The slope of these graphs will be sine i divided by sine r and we know that the sine i divided by sine r that is equal to the refractive index. The refractive index of the glass is approximately 1.5, around about 1.5. So we will look into these graphs and I will choose that graph. That graph will be the correct, that option will be the correct, correct option where the slope of this graph will be 1.5 or near 1.5 or more than 1. So let me take the first option. But before taking the first option, one thing is very clear. The B and C cannot be the answers. The reason is their gradient, their slope is negative. Infra, uh, refractive index cannot be negative. So B and C are not the possible answer. A or D can be the answer. Let me check. Let me check. I have done this on the paperwork or I have not done it. Okay. I'm not done it. Let me copy it from here and show you how I do it. Let me take the snipping tools. So let me just take the shape A. Or I can take all of them. And I will show you how I do it. So let me put this in the paint. Oh, I have not opened the paint. So let me open a file of paint and I will paste it in there. Okay, so here, here we have. Now I will take the first. So let me take this point. Okay. Let me take another one.
okay so the value on the x axis is like 0.5 and the value on the y axis is like 0.7 let me do the calculation so you know the gradient is equals to y divided by x so i will take 0.7 on the y axis divided by on the x axis 0.5 so the gradient will be 1.4 a is the right option because its slope or this gradient is 1.4 which is near to 1.5 so this is the right option let me show you one more thing why this d is not the option okay let me show you so let's take it from here okay so me another line i'm actually working with the mouse so this is this is difficult no? it's a little bit difficult okay so the reading on the y axis i think 0.3 approximately 0.3 and the reading on the x axis is 0.5 so the gradient y divided by uh so the, on the y axis it is like 0.3 and divided on the x axis the reading is 0.5 so divide them the the slope is 0.6 so d cannot be the answer its slope is 1.4 so that is the best option so a is the right option sir a is the right option sir question number 26 a is the right option Question number 27. A swimming pool is lit by an underwater light. A ray of light is incident on the water surface. What is the correct path of the ray of light? Let me copy it from here. Let me copy it from here and I will take it into the paint and then I will show you why the things are wrong and which thing is correct. Okay, so I will bring it in the paint. Bring a new one. So let me paste it here. Okay. Now look at this. Let me draw first of all a normal. This red line is basically a normal. this is a normal the red light is normal so when the light will come out of the water the light is coming out of the dense medium into the rare medium the water is denser as compared to the air so the water is the light is coming from a denser medium into the air uh, into the rare medium so the light must be bended away from the normal the light should be bended away from the normal so the light should have followed a path like this you see this green path why because the light is entering from a denser medium into the rare medium when the light enters from a denser medium into a rare medium its speed increases so that's why it bends away from the normal so the light should have gone something like uh, the green color line the b cannot be the answer it's a wrong bending a cannot be the answer d cannot be the answer so the only correct option left is that if the process of total internal reflection will take place and if the process of total internal reflection takes place at the boundary of a dense medium and a rare medium and then you can you know the angle of incidence here because you have a hard copy you can check these angles also they will be equals to each other this angle of incidence the angle i the angle i and the angle r angle of incidence and angle of reflection they will be equal to each other because here the process of total internal reflection is taking place so i think c is the best option 
I think C is the best path which the light can take. So C is the path. Question number 27. C is the path, uh, the, the correct path which the light will take. Question number 27. C is the right option. I hope you have understood. Which diagram shows the action of a converging lens on a parallel beam of light? Uh, this is wrong. This is wrong. This is wrong. D is a very easy question. Um, this is a textbook question. Very easy. You know, so D is the right option. Because it's a converging lens. It will converge the light rays which are parallel to the principal axis onto its principal focus. So D is the right option. All the three other options are wrong. What is a feature of red light compared with that of the violet light? What is a feature of red light compared with the while you you remember those code words what are the code words uh, if you remember i think i have not uh, done this okay so let me write it in the paint so you can uh, kind of understand this the code word is uh, ronald oh roy gb sorry roy G beef. That is the order. Okay. B I V. Roy G Biv. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Roy G Biv. When you go down, when you go down in this order, the frequency will become larger. It means the violet has very high frequency, red has lower frequency. But when you move upward in this order, the wavelength will increase. It means the red has higher wavelength as compared to the violet. So don't forget this uh, code word, Roy G. Biv. So red has higher wavelength but uh, as compared to the violet, but the violet has higher frequency as compared to the red. So let me go back to the question and let's see what, what they are asking. What is a feature of red light compared with the red, uh, that of violet? A prism deviates the red light more. No, it, the prism deviates red less as compared to violet. Red light has a lower frequency. That is true. This is true as compared to the violet. Red light has a shorter wavelength. That is wrong. I don't know. Uh, red has Basically, the red has longer wavelength. The speed of the red light in a vacuum is smaller. No, in the, in the vacuum, they all travel with the same speed. So question number 29, B is the right option, sir. What is the ratio of the longest sound wavelength audible to a healthy human ear to the shortest? What is the ratio of the longest sound wavelength audible to healthy human ear to the shortest? Okay. So, you know, the wave wavelength, that is equals to uh, v divided by f. Let me show you if I have done this work. Let me show this on the here. Not safe. First, he wants what? He wants the longer sound wavelength. Okay, one thing is very important. So V is equals to F lambda. Okay. 
you know the speed of both the waves whether it's uh, longer wave length shorter wave length that will be the same the, the the sounds which we can hear so f 1 lambda 1 is equals to f 2 lambda Two. If I take lambda two divided by lambda one, it will be equals to uh, f one by f. He wants the uh, uh, sound waves audible to the human ear. Longest sound wavelength. Okay. So uh, the frequency number one. Their product is constant, so they are kind of uh, what are they? Directly proportional. So if F one is twenty, divided by F two is twenty thousand. So, uh, it will be um, something like uh, one, one ratio, one thousand. So, it means lambda. Lambda one value will be one thousand, and lambda two value will be one. So it should be uh, one ratio one thousand. One ratio one thousand, but uh, I think I have put the, or you can say one thousand ratio one. If I will take the because uh, you see, if I take lambda one, which is the lambda one ratio. Uh, lambda two, so I think it will be one thousand ratio one. One thousand ratio one. Very very tricky thing. One thousand ratio one. So I think B is the option. Question number. Thirty B is the option. I think um, I have done it in in a little. Maybe I think I think I have confused you. Uh, but let me show you how we did this again, so you might be able to understand. Uh, v is equals to f lambda. You know this thing. V is equals to f lambda because uh, audible sounds. Uh, Whether it is of twenty hertz or whether it is twenty thousand hertz, they all have the same speed. The sound which we can hear, they all have the same speed. So um, suppose F one lambda one, that is suppose suppose suppose, is the the sound which is whose frequency is twenty, and F two lambda two, that is that sound whose uh, frequency is twenty thousand hertz. So I just because they will have the same uh, speeds. So I made them equal. Their v's are equal. So f one lambda one equals to f two lambda two. So f two divided by f one, f two divided by f one, that will be equals to f one divided by f two. F one is twenty, and f two is twenty thousand hertz. 
So you got lambda two by lambda one. The answer will be one ratio one thousand. But in the question was not this. The question was that the longer wavelength should come first and the shorter wavelength should come afterwards in the ratio. So that's why I, I switched it. So it's one thousand ratio one. That's the B. I hope now it is clear to you. It's a very tricky question. And the way I have tried to explain it, I think I might have confused you. But let's hope for the best. So B is the option. Question number 31. Ultrasound is used to clean jewelry in a liquid. What is another use of the ultrasound? Ultrasound is used for the prenatal scanning, a famous fact which I think most of the students of the O-levels are, are already familiar. So the ultrasound is used for the prenatal scanning. So 31B is the option. Bar magnets and various non-magnetic and demagnetized metal bars are placed in the different uh, arrangements shown. In which arrangement do the bars repel? The bars will repel each other if they both are magnetized and same poles are facing each other. If the same poles will be facing each other, then they will repel each other. If the like poles are facing each other, then the magnets will repel each other. I think D is the option. Question number 32. D is the right option, sir. Here, you see the north and north, they are facing each other. So here we will have a repulsion. There is a varying current in the coil of the loudspeaker shown. The loudspeaker is producing a sound. The magnet is clamped. What is vibrating to produce the sound? You see uh, this coil. In this coil, we introduce the alternating current, and that alternating current in, uh, induces uh, uh, electromagnet on the coil. Its polarity is changing. So sometimes it's attracted to the magnet. Sometimes this coil is repelled because this coil is glued to the paper cone. So when the coil is attracted, the paper cone will move to the left. And when the coil is repelled by the magnet, the paper cone will also move to the outside or it will move towards the right side. So the coil is glued with the help of the glue. You have attached it with the paper cone. So whatever the coil will, wherever the coil will go, the paper cone will also go. So what is vibrating to produce the sound? Coil and the cone. They both vibrate. So question number 33, D is the option. The coil is actually attracted and repelled by the magnet. And because the coil is glued or it is attached with the paper cone, so the paper cone and the coil, they move forward, backward, forward, backward, and they produce sound. Two insulated and uncharged metal spheres, X and Y, are touching. A positively, char a positively charged rod is held near X, and then the spheres are moved apart. X now has a negative charge. What is the charge on the Y? The charge on the Y will be definitely positive, And the size of that or the amount of that positive charge will be equal to the amount of negative charge on the X. Very simple question. I think D is the right option, sir. Positive and the same size as that on the X. X will have negative charge. The Y will have positive charge. And the positive charge on the Y will be equal to the negative charge on the X. So question number 34. D is the right option. A stationary negative charge in an electric field experiences an electric force in the direction shown. So here we have placed a negative charge and it's inside the electric field. And this negative charge is moving towards right. So you see it's a rule. The direction of 
the negative charge always moves opposite to the electric field. The negative charge always moves opposite to the direction of the electric field. So if the negative charge is going to the right, if the negative charge is going to the right, the direction of the electric field will be towards left because the electrons always moves opposite to the direction of the electric field. So, so the direction of the electric field should be opposite to the direction of the motion of the electron. So what is the direction of the electric field? The electric field will be towards left. The electric field will be towards left. So A choice. Question number 35, A is the right choice. A battery consists of three identical cells in parallel. What is the unit of the electromotive force and to what is the EMF of the battery equal? So you have three identical cells in parallel. So you know when you the unit of the EMF, the formula for the EMF is work divided by charge. The formula for the EMF is work divided by charge. So it should be joules per coulomb. The unit of the EMF should be joules per coulomb. Because you have connected the three cells in parallel to each other, so the EMF of the whole thing will be equal to the EMF of an individual cell. So I think B is the best option, sir. Joules per coulomb will be the unit and the EMF of the one of the cells. The, the total EMF will be equal to the EMF of the one of the cells because you have connected them in parallel. The nuclei notation for an isotope of X is XZA. How many neutrons are there in the nucleus? The nuclear notation for an isotope of X is how many neutrons are there in the nucleus? Number of neutrons are equals to number of uh, nucleon number. From there, you subtract the number of protons. So A minus Z. Question number 37, A minus Z. Uh, nucleon number minus proton number or in other words i will say subtract the proton number from the nucleon number and this will give you the number of neutrons radioactivity is used in several activities that take place in hospitals which activity never use radioactivity so diagnosing illness, yes, it used radioactivity. Sterilizing equipment, it used radioactivity. Treating illness, it uses radioactivity. Cooking meals, yes. Cooking meals, we don't use radiation to cook meals. Question number 38, A is the right option, sir. Carbon-614 is a natural radioactive isotope of carbon and is present in all living things. It has a half-life of 5,700 years. How old is a bone that is found to have only one-fourth of the natural proportion of the carbon-614? I've done this on a paper. Let me show you my work. You see, suppose at the start you have n number of atoms and then it will have, after one half life, it will become half, the rest has decayed, n by 2, 
and when another half life will pass by so this n by 2 will further half and it will become n by 4 so his question was when it will become one fourth so how many half lives have passed one two so two half lives so one half life was of 5700 years so two half lives means two multiply 5700 11,400 years have passed. 11,400 years have passed. 11,400 years. So I think B is the right choice. A kettle is connected to a 240 volt mains supply using a plug containing 13 ampere fuse. The kettle contains water. When it is switched on, the fuse blows. This happens again after a few after a new fuse is fitted. Someone replaces the fuse with a nail and the kettle works. What else might happen as a result of replacing the fuse with a nail? If your fuse is blowing again and again, it means that there is some problem. But if you replace the fuse with a nail, so what will happen? Uh, due to the overheating, there is a there there is a possibility that uh, the wiring will get fire. So a very large current overloads the wiring, causing a fire. Yes, that can be the answer. A kettle boils the water less quickly. No, the kettle uses more energy to boil the water. No, the water boils at a higher temperature so a is the best option sir question number 14 a is the best option so by this question we have reached the end of this paper dear students today we have done may june 2020 one one paper this was a mcq paper and it belongs uh, from the variant one or you call it zone one and I have tried my best to explain you the concepts and the tricks in the paper. So hopefully and they will be helpful. To, this video is helpful to you. If this video is helpful to you. And this is helping in improving your co concepts of the physics. Kindly uh, subscribe to my channel. Kindly recommend these videos. If this, these are helpful to you, these can be helpful to other students who, who don't have a teacher with them or uh, who cannot go to school or who cannot go to tuitions. So kindly, kindly recommend other students to watch these videos so they can also improve their grades of physics. So thank you very much, everybody. And uh, don't forget to uh, subscribe and recommend these videos to your friends. So thank you very much. Have a good day. God bless.